everyone and welcome. I'm Christine McGurty, Chief Executive of Water UK and thrilled to be hosting this session today. We're the members body for UK water and wastewater providers in the UK, um, representing all the UK's water companies and leading on policy regulation and campaigns for the sector. So we're really thrilled to be hosting this session. It's one of two we're, we're running this week in the, it's part of our programme in the run up to COP26. And thank you for joining us. We have a wonderful global audience with attendees who've signed up from the Americas, from Europe, um, from Australia, from New Zealand and everywhere in between. So we're really thrilled you could join us to say it today. And I want to say we'd love this to be as interactive as possible. There is a Q&A box on the right hand side of your screen. And do feel free to type questions. They come to us privately if you type in there. Uh, send us questions at any point and we'll be picking them up later in the session. So it's great that we have a global audience because, of course, climate change is a huge challenge for all of us, wherever you are. And it's really important that we're all here discussing and sharing the challenges and the solutions. I should say we have a wonderful array of speakers for you today. I'm not going to list um, out all their credentials or uh, take up half the session in itself but a great array of talent, both from the private sector, the public sector, um, experts with practical expertise, theoretical expertise, scientists, engineers, business people, activists, everyone you need to contribute to, to finding and discussing the solutions to, to the problems before us. Um, we've got two CEOs from UK Utilities. We've got a great panel chair from the International Water Association. We have the chair of the scientific program for World Water Week. We have the CEO for the Water Research Commission, and we have a representative from the International Water Association and more. So you can see that really is a stellar lineup for you. But we hope, before we hear from them, just a few words from me on the UK context. We know that the water industry is really carbon intensive. And in the UK alone, um, the sector emits 3 million tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions a year. Um, but we are getting on top of that. Our members have taken some big steps forward in the last decade by cutting the gross operational emissions by almost 50%. And that's just the start. We then last year published our net zero route map. Um, that is, we believe, the world's first detailed plan for an entire sector to reach net zero on operational missions by 2030. That's ahead of our UK national target. So we don't have all the answers. There is no single answer, but there are multiple pathways. We'll just be proud to be part of the solution. And that's why this year, We've, um, we're really pleased and excited to become an official partner to the UN's Race to Zero campaign to help mobilize the sector worldwide. And I'm really excited. We've got Kate Lamb, the water lead for the UN Climate Champions. She's with us today. And without any further ado, I'll hand over to you, Kate. Thank you, Christine, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Like Christine, I'm really delighted to, to have you be able to join us today. Um, as Christine said, my name is Kate Lamb. I'm the Global Lead for Water within the High Level Climate Champions team. What does that mean in plain English? Well, we're the team that have been appointed by the UNFCCC, the main scientific global body um, that's aiming to address dangerous climate change. They've appointed our team to ultimately deliver ambitious outcomes at this year's COP26 climate conference in Glasgow. And I want to talk to you today about the vital and central role that water utilities play in helping us win our race to zero emissions and a more resilient world. As you know, water is the lifeblood of the global economy. It's the element that binds us together, creating deep and complex interdependencies between communities, businesses and natural ecosystems. Changing the way that we use, store, distribute and treat water holds the key to delivering the net zero resilient future that we all need, indeed that we all deserve. As guardians, owners, managers and distributors of large volumes of water, water related ecosystems and infrastructure, you in the water and wastewater utility sector have a leading role to play in the race to a better future for all of us. 
And in light of the recent IPCC AR6 report, if you haven't read it, I would really recommend that you do. It's safe to say that the time for business as usual approaches to water and wastewater management is over. COP26, therefore, represents the last best chance we have to course correct before humanity faces the worst effects of dangerous climate change. The water and wastewater sector emit the same amount of GHG emissions, those gases that are responsible for causing climate change. Uh, um, they emit the same amount of these gases as the entire shipping sector. And this figure is set to more than double by 2040 as demand increases for scarce water supplies. At the same time, globally, vast amounts of wastewater is currently going, but leaving sites untreated, releasing significant amounts of greenhouse gases as it biodegrades. We're missing vital opportunities to harness the power of this wastewater, turning it into new sources of energy, nutrients, and indeed alternative sources of water in times of scarcity. The wastewater and water sector has a vital role to play in enabling the world to thrive. For example, the 50 largest water utilities on the planet serve over 1 billion people. The actions that they take, therefore, will directly affect the ability of those people to survive the worst effects of climate change. What an amazing opportunity they have. To succeed, the sector must take urgent action, particularly transformational steps, in order to become net zero and resilient as quickly as possible. It's really therefore encouraging to see the leadership coming out of the UK and across to the continents. As such, I'm on a mission alongside all of my peers that are here today with you to get as many water utility companies on board to make net zero commitments ahead of this year's COP26 summit in Glasgow, just eight weeks from now. We want to send a loud resounding signal to governments the world over that it is possible to achieve net zero much sooner than we think, and that water utilities are standing ready to play your part in helping them deliver this goal. We know that many of you will have already made great inroads in your sustainability plans, and we're seeing amazing engagement from those utilities that have already joined us in the race. You'll hear from a few of those today. From harnessing the power of their wastewater to rewilding source water areas, from greening their fleet and electricity supplies to enhancing the resilience of their distribution networks. There is so much potential still to be tapped. Today, we hope to inspire you with examples of best practice and insights as to how to overcome some of the barriers that may exist. And I really look forward to working with you all as we work towards COP26 and beyond. Back to you, Christine. Thank you, Kate, for that um, eloquent and powerful call to action for us all there. I'm really glad to, ha to have you with us today. And I'll just now hand over to Carla, who's going to chair the rest of the session. Carla, over to you. Thanks very much, Christine. And uh, my name is Carla Muthi, and I'm the Executive Director at the International Water Association. And it really gives me great pleasure to be able to host this discussion with such a distinguished panel. The central theme of today's event is the challenges posed by climate change and the opportunities for the water sector, and I think particularly water utilities, to respond to these challenges. Of course, this is a topic that is very relevant to my own association, the International Water Association. Uh, as we all know, there is a need to acknowledge the very real challenges our sector faces, and there's also a need to share insights on the responses. So discussions like this one are really invaluable. And I believe that they help to build momentum for progress. So I'm very pleased that we have such a great panel here today. We have Heidi Mottram of Northumbrian Water, Peter Simpson of Anglian Water, Kambiri Cox of the International Water Association, Deska Naidu of South Africa's Water Research Commission, and John Lane of the Stockholm International Water Week. So to get things started, can I just ask each of the panelists, and we'll kick off with Heidi, to briefly introduce yourself and, and perhaps again very briefly to sort of highlight why this goal to net zero is, is important to you. So over to you, Heidi. Thanks very much, Carla. And um, it's great to be here with uh, such a, a great bunch of panelists, but also to be able to speak to all of you um, about this incredibly important challenge. I don't think I need to say to anybody here why it's important. I'm sure we absolutely 
realise this. And I think the key for us now, we certainly recognise this as a sector in the UK, but even more so globally, is how we collaborate to get the very best ideas and how we innovate together. I'm really, really proud that our sector here in the UK has made a commitment together to achieve this goal of net zero by 2030 and even more proud that we've pushed ourselves a little bit harder to get there by 2027. But what we know more than anything is that we can only do that if we share ideas, um, if we work, up, work together and when we link up. Now we've been thinking about this for for quite a while, probably, you know, 20 odd years now. And we had a particular breakthrough using, as Kate mentioned, the conversion of, of waste water products into, into energy was a real step change for us, along with um, buying it directly into offshore power. Um, and as a result of that, we've managed to reduce our emissions by 82% since 2008, but it's getting to the really tough stuff now. Um, and we need to work and understand all the ideas. You know, I was so excited when I saw how many people have registered for this conference because there's ideas out there that can come to us that we can work with, we can adapt and innovate. And on that subject of innovation, um, I'd love to invite you all, if I could uh, just steal this moment to the innovation festival that we're organizing in October. You can sign up to that at www.innovationfestival.org and um, everybody could come together there. We've got a number of subjects about about net zero but today we're going to get more ideas hopefully I can share some ideas too but that's that's what this is all about for me now is collaboration innovation and how we take that those last steps and really drive this forward because as we all know time is is of the essence thanks thanks very much Heidi for that Peter can I hand over to you Thank you, Carla. Yes, it's fantastic to be here. And uh, I think all the chief execs of UK water companies share share the ambition that Heidi's laid out uh, very much about uh, demonstrating that leadership to net zero by 2030. And it it is, as she said, absolutely fantastic to be part of a sector that is laying out that level of, level of ambition. And it is unlocking um, different ways of working together. I think we've all recognised that um, doing this in, in our own individual silos doesn't crack it. Um, we need to collaborate, we need to innovate together, but not just between water companies, but also across uh, other sectors as well. Uh, we mustn't just sort of imagine that we've got all the answers or all of the challenges ourselves. We've got to look across all of the sectors and in, in water, it's terribly important that we're thinking about you know, links to agriculture, links to food, links to industri other industrial sectors as we, as we go about this challenge. And what's really uh, fantastic is that that is the approach that um, we're taking in, in in the UK water industry, certainly in terms of how we're collaborating and, and innovating. Um, and, and much as Heidi said, you know, many of the companies have been on this journey for many years in terms of trying to unlock the potential for Anglian. Um, we've had a big focus on reducing capital carbon, embodied carbon in, in everything we build um, since about 2010, actually. Um, and we're very proud that we've managed to take 61% out of our uh, capital carbon since that 2010 baseline across all of our assets. But it's just one aspect of the challenge that we all face. And I think the secret now is how can we kind of work together and share our learning, share our experience to actually uh, make, a, make a much bigger impact. And I guess that's really the basis of what we're trying to do today. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, can I ask Kambiri just to introduce herself as well? Kambiri? Oh, thank you, Carla. Hi, everyone. It feels really good to be here amongst really good company. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, so yeah, so today I'll be talking about the Climate Smart Utilities Initiative and really talking about ways in which utilities can get the tools and resources they need. We know, as Kate mentioned, we know this is our last chance, you know, to really make sure we're on the right path in transitioning to net zero. So really making sure that utilities know what resources are available, who they can go to for best practices, who they can go to for learning what's the latest tools that are free and open source. And that's what we're about today. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thanks, Kambiri. And over to you, Des. Uh, thank you, Kala, and uh, good day, everyone. It's wonderful to have all these folk uh, in the seminar. You know, uh, the, the recently published IPCC report is kind of telling us that we're almost at the last chance saloon. That if we don't get it right now, if we don't do the right kind of pathway shifting now, 
we will, of course, survive as a species, but with a much more difficult pathway. And this is something I think we have to take cognizance of. But coming from the global south, this offers opportunity as well. So the way I'm looking at it, the way my colleagues are looking at it, is that we're in a sector that is unbelievably conservative. You know, we are trying to solve the 21st century problems with 20th century technology and 19th century operating rules. So this is a call to action. This is a catalytic point to actually catch up with our current capability in order to build a pathway forward. But for the Global South, it's a little bit more than that. You know, like water has been a fundamental building block of the high carbon economy, we see this as an opportunity for a transformed water sector becoming once again a building block for now a low carbon economy. And hopefully on the back of this, to rapidly accelerate development in my part of the world. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Des. Now, John, I'm going to ask you to also introduce yourself, but I'm also going to ask you to respond to a sort of a broader question because, you know, we understand that the water sector faces all kinds of challenges and that to chart the course for action, we need to get clear on the issues at hand. So I'd also want you, John, to sum up to us, you know, the climate change challenges that our sector is facing and how we translate that into action, both in terms of mitigation and resilience. So over to you, John. Uh, thanks, Carla. Hello, everybody. Great to be here. Uh, my name's John Lane. I've spent most of my career working on water and sanitation for poor people in developing countries. Um, and at the moment, I, I chair the scientific program committee for World Water Week in Stockholm. So I'm concerned with, with a sort of broad overview of all issues to do with water. Uh, I, I think the topic today uh, is very important personally to me because I have two grandchildren. Uh, and I want them to lead uh, healthy, safe, happy lives. And I want the same thing for everybody else's grandchildren as well. Res responding to your uh, question now, Carla, it, I, I have a, a little piece of woodland uh, in which badgers live. And they come out of their underground sets where they live and they go a little distance and they dig a hole and they poo in it. So when you walk around in the woodland, you see these little holes with very neat piles of badger poo. They do not soil the place in which they live. And almost every animal species is the same, except one. The animal with the biggest brain and the biggest self-importance on the planet, which is human beings. You know, we are pumping billions and billions of tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, and we're cooking the planet on which our, our lives and our civilization depend. It, it, it defies common sense. I, I think climate change is a rather benign term uh, for the chaos which our global heating uh, is triggering. And we know that we're doing it, and we know how to reverse it, but we're not starting to do it fast enough. And I think that's probably because people are, tend to be greedy uh, and selfish uh, and think in the short term. Uh, as President Kennedy said in his famous speech about a strategy for peace, he said, our problems are man-made, therefore they can be solved by man, and man can be as big as he wants. I think the targets for greenhouse gas reductions are so ambitious, and indeed they must be, that everybody in all walks of life must play our role. And those who have been emitting the most can make the biggest reductions, and those who are involved in the work which is most directly related to climate, and of course water people and utilities, the subject of today's discussion, come into that category, uh, must take a lead on it. And the rallying cry we've heard already from Kate and, and others it is for net zero carbon emissions. And, and the politicians and the decision makers around the world in setting their ambitious targets for net zero, they are concentrating almost completely about mitigation uh, rather than adaptation. I'm slightly concerned that across the water sector around the world, we've generally still been talking more um, about adaptation. So I think it's great that there are a number of people, including uh, those gathered here today, who are starting to pay much more attention uh, to mitigation. We have to do both. Uh, and well done, Water UK, uh, adopting your roadmap to zero, and well done. 
the utilities in the UK reaching out to friends and colleagues uh, all around the world through events like this. In terms of mitigate, mitigation, my, my feeling is as follows, that it, it's no good putting our hands up to politicians and saying, oh, you know, excuse me, our, our sector is very important. You know, we need money, we need your attention, we need you to help us. That's, that's you know, not going to achieve anything. I think it's a much more powerful message for us to say to politicians and to other decision makers around the world to say, hey, here, water is a tool which you can use to achieve your targets. And, and I can already hear that underlying uh, some of the comments that have been made this morning. The, the leading research on this around the world was, is really, was really carried out by the German agency GIZ a couple of years ago and uh, Stockholm International Water Institute, Potsdam Institute and others are taking that on and you'll see more publications coming out at COP26. Uh, and picking through that, I think the three biggest mitigation measures uh, related to water are reducing methane emissions from rice paddies, um, storing carbon and reducing methane emission from peatland and reducing methane emission from wastewater treatment. And this event clearly is most related to that third point. And, and when I think that global wastewater treatment or dealing with human excreta in general generates approximately 2% of global methane emissions, and it uses approximately 2% of global power consumption, the elegant solution has to be, uh, let's harness that methane to generate that power. That's a classic win-win. People in rural India have been doing it for decades. Why don't we all do it? Um, so thanks to everyone attending. I'm looking forward to the rest of the discussions. Uh, keep up the great work that, you're, that you've started on. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. That was a great overview of some of the challenges and some of the responses we're, we're making. And I'd like to sort of just put that to desk. I mean, we've, we've talked a lot about the drivers for change, but I wanted to get your perception of some of these drivers, especially in the context of the global south, where we know that, you know, we are well, they are facing many, many challenges right so how do you see all of this fitting into that sort of broader context of some of the sort of more basic challenges that, that you see in, in the global south thank you color um look it's it's a combination of things first let me take a leaf from john around the adaptation agenda and the adaptation focus i mean for the global south this is if you like the the bigger agenda in the short term but along the right kind of pathway to the mitigation agenda. And this is quite vital. Uh, but let me start with opportunity first, Kala. The, the, the opportunity that exists in the global south is because of the lower level of development, there is actually a lesser investment in the high carbon pathway, which means that the global south in general, and some places in particular like Africa, become almost the perfect laboratory around what a green economy can actually look like. And this is an economy that has the opportunity to develop out the models required to have this as mainstream all over the world. So the first thing I want to put out there is an invitation to start conceptualizing the global South in general and Africa in particular as a global laboratory for what a future low carbon world can actually look like. The second thing that I want to put into the plate is that we have to deal with the issue of inequality. And inequality has a range of dimensions, as you all well know, and COVID and the pandemic has reminded us ever so starkly around the nature of the inequality that there exists around the world. And what we have to do in this domain is to expand the envelope of the solutions. And one of the important things to do it is a reorganization of the thinking around what utilities mean and what this utilities stakeholder group is. Now, the South's quite different from the North in, in many of these ways. And the thing that we want to push very strongly to have the right kind of global reach around this is the empowerment of all of the users in the system to become responsible water users and part of that global water team. Which means that when you look at things like, like wastewater treatment, which has been mentioned a few times already, there is the notion of what the centralized approach and the transformation of the centralized approach can do, but you need much more investment in the decentralization. So the things that come to the fore in a very pronounced way are things like non-sewage sanitation. And we know that this is important enough 
for places like the IWA to have a very big new investment in these kinds of domains. And I think if we put all of those blocks together and we link them up to a new developmental model, then we are probably moving in the right direction. I'll pause there for now. Thanks very much, Des, and I think it's quite inspiring to think that there are a lot of lessons that can be learned from the Global South because they are embarking on, on this new path. Um, what I'd like to now do is to look at the sort of the mitigation part of the equation, and I'd like to think mainly about the UK initially and then get an international perspective. So I'd like to start with Peter. Um, and Peter, I just wanted you to sum up some of the opportunities that water utilities have to act on mitigation and some of the different dimensions, such as, say, the types of financing, the types of sort of sewage treatment plants that, that, that we might develop that can really contribute to, to this goal for, for net zero. So over to you, Peter. Thanks, Carla. Um, I guess, you know, we as uh, water companies sort of lent into this and said, we need to demonstrate uh, leadership on, on the journey to net zero. Uh, we didn't have all of the answers uh, when, we, when we looked at the, the challenge. And I know in the early days, uh, there was a feeling with particularly uh, the water only companies, companies that are just producing uh, drinking water, that it would be very easy for the wastewater side of the industry to achieve this. Principally for, for the reasons that have just been cited, you know, the opportunities from anaerobic digestion uh, to make good use of methane and, and offset some of, some of the, uh, the impact. Um, what, what came to pass as we really got into this a few years ago and looking at the detail was we recognized that actually process emissions were a bigger challenge for us, particularly on the, the, the water recycling side. And, um, and there hadn't been a lot of work done in that area. And that would be a big challenge and is a big challenge for us in terms of innovation and, and collaboration. I think Heidi might uh, touch on that uh, a little bit later. Um, the other thing that uh, became fairly obvious to us is if we can actually find opportunities to reduce the amount of the product that our customers are using, then that, that can be a real win-win. Um, and of course, when you're talking about the global perspective, not everybody is lucky enough to have the water supply situation that we have here in the UK. But in the UK, if we can reduce demand for water by reducing leakage, if we can implement uh, smart metering, if we can encourage water efficiency in terms of development of, of new, new houses, but also in existing properties, then that's a really good thing because that will actually reduce our overall um, carbon footprint. So there's something very much about efficient efficiency. And you know, the water industry in the UK, if I pick up leakage as an example, we've committed to tripling our, our rate of leakage reduction. So it's direct, you know, it, it's absolutely joined at the hip in terms of that. How can we actually reduce the amount of product we produce? Because that will reduce our, our carbon footprint. Um, it's also about thinking more laterally about the amount of carbon, the carbon footprint associated with treatment. So if we can begin to better understand how we can manage at a catchment level and avoid things getting into catchments that we then have to take out through treatment processes, we can significantly reduce our carbon footprint. And there are many examples. I mean, one particular one that springs to mind in, in Anglian is the work we've done over the last five years, uh, reducing uh, a particularly difficult pesticide called metaldehyde in uh, which is a slug a slug pesticide getting that reduced in the in the rivers that we take water from which has actually meant that we've then not had to implement really chemically intensive carbon intensive energy intensive treatment processes so it's not just about the amount of the product it's also about the what we can do in terms of reducing the need to treat and and the car and the carbon footprint associated with that and then you know, many of us have, have lots of land and there are opportunities there you know, in terms of uh, renewables. So today it's a sunny day, the largest water treatment works in, in Anglian water is running on a solar array, a 42,000 panel solar array, 12 megawatt. Um, so there are really clear opportunities. And if you asked me even five, six years ago, whether I would imagine our largest, most critical asset in many ways, would be running on solar panels. I, I suspect I would have uh, not 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 believed you, but it is. So uh, there are we as an industry have lots and lots of opportunities. And when when you think about the, the, the last couple of points I'd make is when we think about the opportunities, what's become really really clear to me is actually the wall of finance out there is enabling a different approach to be taken by perhaps some of those conservative 
utilities that were referred to earlier. So, you know, we released, we've released green bonds for many years. And in this last year, we've released a, a bond directly linked to reducing our carbon emissions. Uh, and the key thing about that is it's got penalty, it's got rewards and penalties. If we're on the trajectory to net zero, then we win. It saves us millions of pounds of interest. If we don't, uh, then we pay more. So there's ways in which to fund and finance um, the way we operate in a very different world. So there are, there are I, I like the, the comment earlier on, there are opportunities here. I think it's really important as we, as we present some of these challenges, we don't just talk about the downside, we actually talk about the opportunities that, uh, that come with it as well. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Peter. And it was really interesting the way you were talking. You, you were talking in a sort of very integrated perspective, this sort of viewing the entire water cycle as one and looking at where the gains can be both in the sort of the drinking water side, but also in the used water side. And that's something that's really missing in many parts of the world because we have fragmented institutions. What I'd like to ask is, is our Heidi to compliment some of the things that, that Peter said. Um, and give further insights into sort of water utility action, especially from the perspective of Northumbrian water. So over to you, Heidi. Okay, thanks very much, Carla. And um, I guess what, what I was perhaps going to centre on a little bit more would be the, the wastewater um, side of things. Um, my company, Northumbrian Water, um, operates probably in a much wetter part of the UK um, than Peter's does in, in Anglian, where it's very dry. And we've been facing um, different challenges and how can we think about how we use the resources available to us to to address some of those um, now interestingly when when I first joined the water industry because I'm not a I'm not a water industry lifer one thing that that struck me was that over years the the pursuit had really been around around quality um, quality of the drinking water how clean could we get it how much cleaner could we get it um, and also the quality of wastewater likewise. Um, and of course, in, in pursuing that, people hadn't been thinking about the use of resources, hadn't been thinking about um, carbon reduction at all. And so quite a lot of this had been achieved by the use of chemicals or power. Um, and now, you know, we're, we're trying rapidly to, to keep that quality, of course, because that's about keeping our environment um, and our health as good as we possibly can, but wind that back and take it out. And I think, the key thing in all of this is mindset shift um, and really understanding the whole cycle cost of what you're doing. So thinking about that more on the on the wastewater side, one of the things I think that we are really understanding more is how we harness the wider environment to help us in, in the process. And in particular, for example, um, using sustainable drainage, looking around in catchments to see how water can be attenuated, can be held back. Um, often that can be done in ways that absolutely enhance an environment through the creation of wetlands and biodiversity um, by working with partners who have some of that land that perhaps isn't available to us and collaboration is a word I think we'll hear a hundred times on this conference today and how you can link up with other people um, and get benefits and that's something that we've really uh, driven hard over the last 10 years in particular schemes where we're taking many, many thousands of, of cubic meters of water um, out, of, out of the system and therefore out of pumping, out of treatment um, into, into nature-based solutions. And that can be linked up, you know, as Peter was saying, to thinking about, well, how do you then use nature to clean the water before it becomes treatment as well? So some of those schemes are as useful to the clarity of water as they are um, to actually holding back wastewater so it's really a, a much more circular set of thinking um, and also, you know, coming on to that um, conversation about advanced anaerobic digestion and the, and the creation of biomethane, that was just a total flip over of mindset into treating something that we, which we thought was a waste and how could we get rid of it um, into actually there's some resource here and some value. And in doing that, we also captured um, all of the biomethane and were able to, to use it. Now, we, you know, there's more to be done and, and Peter alluded to the fact that, you know, some of the other process emissions around wastewater, we still need to tackle. Um, we've got some of that process stuff going on, if you like, in the open air and releasing some of those gases. But we need to now really think about 
how we do that without throwing power at it again, because all the processes before were about how we throw power. How can we do that in a benign way, ideally, you know, carbon negative way, but still make sure that that isn't released into the environment? And that's an area where there's some real innovation needed, I think, over the next couple of years. We've, as I say, we've captured a huge amount of this biomethane through technologies like AD and AAD but there is still some to go at. And um, I'm hoping that there are people on this call that have got some ideas around that or companies that have perhaps um, worked in that space as well. And then actually, if I, if I could just mention another one, and maybe this might be more a problem in developing, in developed countries rather, but some of these things aren't actually to do with the basic processes, but areas where we're making life worse for ourselves. Um, and in, in the UK, we have this, I'm fairly certain we have it um, around many other countries. Um, we've got the scourge of the wet wipe um, and people putting these into sewage systems. And this is causing a huge amount of um, cost in terms of pumping. Um, they're incredibly heavy to move around. They cost blockages. And I hope that together the water industry, particularly for countries that haven't perhaps um, started to see this as a problem, make sure that you stop it at source, really. Um, but this is something that, you know, I think is sometimes treated as a separate issue, but is actually massively related to this whole um, net zero journey because of the costs associated with it, the production of, of them in the first place, the problem that they're causing in the sewage system, um, and then the, the waste um, that, that happens afterwards. So it's not always just about the, the human element of it, it's other human activities linked in here too. Thanks very much, Heidi, for that. It's very insightful and it's very interesting to hear how the UK is, is sort of moving towards sort of these hybrid sort of grey and green infrastructure type systems. And I think the opportunities that nature-based solutions provide both in terms of mitigation, but also adaptation. Because uh, I think Peter mentioned that, you know, the cost of reuse, the cost of some of these more exotic water sources are energy intensive. But then if we if we look to nature-based solutions, there are real opportunities for us. So thanks very much for that, Heidi. Um, what I'd like to now do is to get sort of an international perspective. So I'd like to turn to Kambiri. Uh, Kambiri, so you're leading IWA's Climate Smart Water Utilities Programme. And I just wanted to ask you, what type of opportunities are you seeing from across the world in terms of mitigation? Thank you very much, Carlo. Yes, I'm the project manager for the IWA Climate Smart Utilities Programme, which was really born out of the project that we did in collaboration with GIZ. So as John Lane mentioned, GIZ is doing a lot of great work on mitigation and a lot of publication in this arena. But in particular, we have collaborated with them on having a roadmap for water and wastewater utilities to really kind of um, make sure this process isn't too overwhelming for utilities, particularly those in developing oh, countries. So this roadmap is about really motivating utility leaders into action to assessing where utilities lie with respect to GHG emissions, finding opportunities for improving their processes so how can they make the processes leaner? How can they make them more efficient? And how can they make sure that they're actually not contributing to a greater greenhouse gas emissions overall? And then finding the solutions for implementation and then finally monitoring performance. So we've collaborated with GIZ on this project and also in the development of a tool for wastewater and water utilities called ECAM. And this in particular color is what we use when we are talking to utilities and how you can really go about transitioning to net zero. So this tool allows them all to really evaluate where they stand with respect to emissions, assess their system, their really unique system and see, okay, what can work for us in terms of solutions? Can nature-based solutions be incorporated? Do we have the land to really take on new initiatives like this? Where can we look at finding our green renewable energy solutions? How can we contribute back to the grid? So that's something that we're talking to our utilities about. ECAM is now in over 100 countries, um, mostly in low, low income countries. And we've have, we have a new version that's going to be launched by GIZ at COP26. So aside from that, we're really trying to build off of the Wacklin project and work towards seeing how can we bring more collaborators into the mix? How can we profile tools from Creda? How can we profile tools from 
a collaboration with the Nature Conservancy on looking at nature-based solutions for water supply. So we're really trying to bring everyone together in the same room, have an exciting exchange of ideas, have these utilities present what worked for them, what doesn't work for them in their country context, and really bring the best practices to the fore. So that's something that we're looking at there. And of course, we're collaborating a lot in showcasing the work from the Danish utilities in our network. As you know, Denmark has this mandate where they're really focusing on transitioning to net zero. And the government has provided a lot of opportunities for utilities to get on board. And we've seen the private sector getting involved there and finding creative solutions for Danish utilities on how they can really uh, make their processes leaner, as I mentioned, and how they can contribute to the grid and support overall the energy economies and really reducing greenhouse gas emissions overall. So as um, just a, a quick invitation there to Copenhagen, where we'd have these Danish utilities being profiled as well, as well as a lot of the utilities in our network where they can present these solutions and really help other utilities around the world on this transition to net zero. Thank you. Very much, Kimberly. And I think again, one of the strengths here, and it's sort of come out in all of the discussion, is about knowledge sharing and collaboration. I think with with the program that you lead, it's it's really people learning from each other, right? It's this sort of peer to peer sort of exchange that we see. Um, Jessica, I'd just like to ask you, um, in terms of the needs and opportunities for climate change, um, you know, how diverse are these, and what does it mean for our thinking here? Diversity is, is a very big part of the challenge color because, you know, uh, listening to the folk uh, talking from the UK utilities, you're talking about fine tuning a system that is already pretty close to universal access, if not exactly at it. And we're looking at most of the world that is very, very far away from that. Uh, and I mean, you know, the, the, the whole reason for the Global Acceleration Framework is to catalyze this movement towards this universal access by 2030. So on the one side, there's an almost inevitable carbon budget associated with putting in infrastructure that doesn't exist at all. But I think we're also very clear that there's a huge opportunity around that. And that opportunity comes in organizing for this plug of the very best knowledge that we have now. So, you know, moving into the domain of sanitation and wastewater treatment, for example, if we organize for the dominant paradigm to be non uh, waterborne sewage and non sewage systems with an appropriate beneficiation of waste back end uh, series of, of treatments. And we know a lot of this because we, we've been all participating in the gates. Uh, reinvent the toilet challenge for the past 10 years or so. If that becomes the mainstream in much of the developing world, then I think one, we will have the sustainable solutions we want to see. And two, it will not only embed a low carbon character in the water and sanitation industry, but the knock on effect it will have because it will stimulate a very particular kind of industrialization model in the rest of the economy. This in turn, could be the bedrock, if you like, of the low carbon economy. The threat is if we don't do it that way, we're going to be in a huge amount of trouble because regardless of what Peter does and what Heidi does, if the 50, 50 mega cities, new mega cities on this African continent are going to be around in 2050, and if they're building up those mega cities on a very old carbon intensive paradigm, we are in collective trouble in unbelievable proportions. That's our fundamental reality. So getting this as a global investment around getting this right in the hotspots around the world, I think is absolutely key. And we can turn that diversity into an opportunity for all of us. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Scott. So thanks for that, uh, Desigan. And, and as you know, 85% of wastewater is not treated you know, globally. And it's not just the usual suspects of South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, but it's also Central Asia, Eastern Europe, South America, and, and we are on the cusp, you know, we say IWA is the golden age, next 20 years will be the golden age for wastewater and sanitation. So the direction they take, the direction of travel, I think it's gonna be very interesting, right? And, and I think some of the options that you've highlighted will, will certainly be very, very important to, to lower the carbon footprint of some, of some of that infrastructure. We've got a couple of questions from the audience that I'd like to share, particularly with Peter and Heidi. We have a question from Mike Waite, um, 
Um, his question is, with a typical asset life of 20 years, the water sector needs to embrace transformative and exponential change. How is this being communicated down the management structure of your organization? So Heidi, do you want to take that first and then I'll hand it over to Peter. Thanks very much and uh, thanks Mike for your, for your question because it's a, it's a really thought provoking one. And the approach that we've taken in, in Northumbrian Water is to champion the fact that innovation is everybody's job. So we don't have an innovation team, we don't have an innovation department. Um, we've taken, I guess, our main tools around collaborative innovation, um, around open innovation. You heard me mention the Innovation Festival um, in my opening remarks. And our goal is to get as many people as we possibly can in, in our company and actually in partnership with other companies um, involved in this, in this journey. Um, the Innovation Festival has been a, a game changer for us. Um, last year, we were, we were operating in 37 countries around the world in that week and with 900 different organizations. So you can see where the appetite and the hunger is for people to get involved. And bringing it, I guess, di directly back to your question, that's causing us to question almost everything. Now, there is, a, if you like, a reality about the fact that when we build an asset, it is there for a long time. That's uh, clearly going to be you know, part of its efficiency. But we are really thinking hard now about whole life costing, about adaptation, about agility and whether or not things can be changed and, and just challenging absolutely everything that we can think about. And we get great ideas from within um, the business. Um, we've got everything from, from garage inventors um, through to we run a, a kind of innovation challenge every year inside the company and, and put you know hundreds of thousands of pounds behind back in our um, employees ideas so it's cultural it's change it's about support it's about what I say um, and it's about saying it's all about learning it's all about working with other people and it's all about collaborating and you know that that will turn a ship and I think the other thing I'd give a shout out to which is very new but I think is a positive development is the uh, is the innovation fund that was established in in this last regulatory cycle as well um, because that's just going to facilitate even more collaboration. There's always been brilliant collaboration in my experience going on within the industry and, and lots of, of self-help, if you like, but that's going to stimulate even more and uh, facilitate other companies and perhaps other collaborators getting involved um, and, and other industries as well where we need to, to work with them. So I, I hope that's encouraging to you. Um, I'd love to hear from you if you've got some ideas. Um, but definitely our, our whole view is about it's everybody's job. Um, and this is the only way that we're going to solve some of these problems. If I could ask you to also respond to that, but could I also ask you to respond to a question we had from James Robinson where he mentions that we have 300,000 acres of land um, and he wanted to know what the UK water companies were doing to develop partnerships to release some of that land for some of this sort of hybrid infrastructure that you were talking about, you know, where, where, in, where we're embarking on a much more sort of nature-based solution roadmap. Um, so if you could address that as well, Peter. Sure, thank you, Carla. Uh, I mean, I, the points that Heidi made about you know, innovation and collaboration being in the culture of uh, the organisation is, is absolutely at the heart of cracking this. I, I guess the other thing that I would add is, I, I think, presenting some challenges so that incremental is not, not an option. So you have to think about a more uh, transformative change. And I, I use the example of something we did back in, in 2010, which was committing to half the embodied or capital carbon in everything we build as an example of that sort of change. And what it has led to in our, in our organization is a much closer partnership between the company and its supply chain in tackling that challenge. And it's led to different solutions. It's led to rather than just incremental changes to the current uh, infrastructure that we actually operate, it's led to different approaches. And that's important because that's actually the only way we're going to we're going to crack this. We can't. It's not just about incremental progress. It's actually about making some step changes. Um, and and ultimately, that's how we we've managed to get our capital carbon down uh, to say by about sixty one percent since that that twenty ten 
baseline, lots of different solutions, lots of different collaborations, not just between water companies, but critically with our supply chain, where there's some fantastic, fantastic ideas. And it's about giving people permission. Um, it's kind of recognising the point that was made earlier that this is a relatively conservative industry. And so we as leaders have to create the right environment and give people permission to do things differently. And that's one of the ways in which, uh, we, which we've done it. Just your point about the, uh, the the land. I suppose there's multiple different different perspectives to this. If I think of some examples of of where we've been working with with landowners, we've been working with them not just in terms of water quality. And there's some really good examples in the UK of work water companies have been doing on peat in particular to improve water quality. But more increasingly, looking at opportunities to work together to improve biodiversity and also looking at sequestration opportunities, particularly in, in soils. So we've got a number of initiatives going at the moment with you know, farmers um, and other big landowners, where essentially we're working on how do we get multiple layered benefits from what we're trying to do? How do we actually make sure that as a result of changes to farming practices, we avoid, for example, nitrates levels going up in groundwater, which means then we avoid the cost of treatment and the carbon intensive nature of that. How, if at the same time as doing that, can we increase the biodiversity uh, in that particular land area? And how do we actually also increase the opportunity to sequester carbon? So how do we layer up those? So rather than thinking about it in just narrow silos, how do we join it together and say, how do we get the biggest bang for, for our efforts that we're putting in? So I think that's, and, and all of those things require uh, different thinking, they require innovation, they, they require collaboration, and it isn't just between us as water companies, it's between uh, us uh, as water companies, our supply chain, the landowners, a wide variety of, uh, of NGOs, uh, in order to get the, the, the best answer, I guess. Thanks very much for that, uh, Peter. I'm conscious of the time. There is another question, which I think we'll part later, when we talk about barriers, and this came from Tim Lowe, it's really about the obstacles for using some of the energy that you're generating, the methane for power, and how we, we overcome them. So we'll, we'll touch upon that, and that's something, John, you might want to think about some of the barriers that, that we have. We'll come to that a bit later. I'd like to now move on to adaptation, um, and I'd like to start with Heidi. I mean, adapting to climate change can mean adapting to wetter conditions and to drier conditions. In terms of wetter conditions, what are the sort of things that the utilities are doing, particularly in the UK? Heidi. OK, thank, thanks very much for that. Um, I think really one of, one of the real issues that we're having, it's partly the, the, the wetter conditions, if you like, in, in the round, but it's, it's, the, it's the storminess, as we tend to call it. Um, it's the intensity and how and how it's falling and how those how that can be dealt with um, the water coming at us um, all, all at once and rushing into the system. And we've touched on it in a in a number of ways in some of the answers to the previous questions. But what we've been working on, um, many of us, and, and we've certainly been doing it for a number of years, is how can we um, look at the catchment more widely um, and think about where we can slow the flow where we can attenuate water, um, where we can where we can capture it. Now, we do have land holdings as water companies, but in these scenarios, the vast majority of that land is likely to be held by somebody else, um, particularly as you come closer into urban environments and, and where you, you become even closer to, to human, um, you know, humans living. So um, a good example of this would be um, that we did in the centre of Newcastle, about eight or nine years ago now, where we got into partnership with um, the Environment Agency, the local authority, and ourselves. And interesting, I think there's an a point here, and different countries work differently, um, where I think we need to get more collaboration between, between regulators and their environments as well, because what we found was that um, all, of, all of those people could work together, if you like, as hydrologists and start to think about the solution but they were at the beginning hidebound by the rules and regulations that apply to their particular organization and how they justified what they were doing, if you like, upwards in their chain. And we decided, and of course, this is, this is about leadership and leadership is always absolutely critical to any kind of change. 
we decided that we wouldn't we wouldn't um, go with that. What we would do is to say, come on, we're going to forget anything to do with the rules and regulations. We'll come into the room and we'll design the system that makes the most sense um, in terms of biodiversity, in terms of water attenuation, in terms of as many goals, sensible low carbon goals as we can possibly think of. And when we've designed the scheme, we'll work out how to fund it. And that broke a lot of taboos um, and allowed us to access funding sources that had never been um, brought before and to do work on behalf of other organizations that they usually would have taken ownership for themselves. And, and the really unusual thing in the middle of all of that was, was a, a conversation with a golf course who, you know, and these things can make a big difference. It was a golf course that financially was very vulnerable. Um, if we had, um, that they didn't want any disruption to their operations, but ultimately we actually designed them two new holes um, with water features in and added value to their water, to their golf course, um, as well as getting what we needed in terms of um, being able to hold on to water in, in some swales as well. And, you know, thankfully they were able to, to be, you know, open in their mindset too. And that's where I think just generally we've got to look at how we are valuing these things. And quite a number of people now I think are understanding more the idea of natural capital accounting um, and really thinking much wider. Whereas I think our regulatory systems, some of our rules and regulations are constraining us at the moment because we can't, um, if you like, claim benefit for something that ultimately has a benefit because it's indirect um, to the operation. And I think that you know governments need to think about that more widely. Regulators need to think about that more widely to free up organizations to collaborate, to work with other landowners um, and to, to capture these benefits. Yeah. I think I think that was a really good response, Heidi. I, I mean, two points really. The whole sort of use of nature-based solutions. They, they they also have this sort of adaptive capacity, and there's a lot of uncertainty associated with with precipitation, particularly intensity, duration, and frequency, and how we can use these systems in a sort of more modular way to sort of incrementally grow our response to rainfall, and also this whole area of transfer of benefits. I think the spillover effect of investments in water infrastructure are never really recognised, and how do we create that dialogue to ensure that you know people understand that real estate prices go up, places become more livable because of the way in which we're managing our water. I'd like to go over to Peter um, and turn to sort of drier conditions. And you know, could you share some insights for us in this for this, Peter? I mean, in particular, I've seen Anglian Water's involvement in water, in water resources east, which I suppose implies that building resiliency needs to be considered at a regional level, involve many other stakeholders. And I just wanted to ask you how important that dimension is, or is it is it largely about what a utility can do? And, and connected to that, Peter, I've, we've had two questions, one from Sue James and also from Clement, and it's really about how much involvement and discussions are you having with consumers and, and users of your services when you have these discussions around, say, uh, water usage. So over to you, Peter. A great, it's a great uh, question. Perhaps I'll start at that point. Um, the discussion with our customers is, is really important. And uh, the, the great news is, you know, we, uh, over the last five, six years, we've had multiple engagements with customers and, and they absolutely get the, the challenges that we face as a result of the changing climate and the need for their company to do something about it. Um, in, in Anglian, we sit in the driest part of the UK we're already water scarce and we see the impact of, of that um, increasingly challenging environment and our customers get it. They've got a very important part to play. So one of the aspects of what we're doing is rolling out a big water efficiency program together with smart metering. And it's very important that they, they play their part and that we help them to be more water efficient uh, in existing houses, not uh, as well as you know, new houses that are being built. Because we won't solve it on our own so it has you know that has to be a partnership so we talk about partnerships a lot and collaboration well but the most fundamental one actually is that relationship with our customers um, and getting that right but to, to the broader point um one of the things that um we as water companies in the uk recognized quite a few years ago actually probably about six seven years ago was that we needed to demonstrate leadership at a national level and we started working as water companies not not at the behest of a regulator or anybody else, but we started working as water companies on what got, what became known as the Long-Term Water Resource Management Planning Framework, very long title. Um, but essentially it was saying, 
increasingly we are seeing different patterns of weather and it's no longer possible just to plan on the basis of a fixed future that you think will might might come that come your way and a bit of headroom which is kind of how water resources have been planned for, for for many decades before and it's a good example of where it was kind of breaking out of the traditional ways of thinking about things perhaps the conservative ways of of doing things and saying let's let's think differently so it led to a scenarios based approach and out of that scenarios based approach that was done as as part of that work that you know was really led by water uk um came the realization that you can no longer assume that it's always going to be wet in the lake district in the uk and it's always going to be dry in, in anglian water that actually not only was generally things getting dry but there's a lot more variability and it leads to the, the, the flood issues that Heidi's just referenced, but it also leads to uh, changes to patterns of precipitation, which render some of the systems that we've developed over the last 50, 50 odd years no longer as useful as they might be. So that bit of work, I mean, why that bit of work was so pivotal is it ultimately led to a whole series of regulatory changes. So this is a good example of, I think, the leadership point that Heidi was making. If we go ahead and do something like this, actually we find that others will follow and regulators followed and government followed. Uh, rules were changed so there was a greater level of resilience to drought implemented in lots of the guidance so it went to one in two, you know, build resilience to one in 200 year droughts and in fact it's going to be build resilience to one in 500 year droughts in the next in the next plans all off the back of this bit of work but also plan regionally and plan nationally for water. So within Water Resources East, we have there a group that looks across the eastern area of the country, but it doesn't just include water companies, it includes all users of water, whether they be the power sector, the environmental sector, farming, irrigation, all, of, all, all involved in developing a regional plan for water, not just assuming or just a siloed approach. And then let's make sure we've got these regional groups around the country comprising more than just the, the one water company, multiple organizations. And then let's have that, that read across nationally. And let's see what are the big uh, moves we need to make, particularly in terms of infrastructure. And what, what are the things that we need to do that will actually deliver, you know, deliver the best results for the country as a whole? Yeah. It's, it's very, very much twin track. It's about keeping demand down. It's about leakage. It's about metering, getting demand down. But it's also about, you know, what are the systems? And one of the really positive things that the, the, the regulatory um, framework has done is implement something called RAPID, the Rag Regulatory Alliance for Progressing Infrastructure. And essentially, this is a meeting of minds of regulators to help accelerate some of the big changes that need to happen. So in Anglian, we're building a 500 kilometer pipeline from the north of the region right the way down to the southeast as part of that broader infrastructure. And there are plans for big new reservoirs, but the, the key thing is they're not going to be done in isolation. They're not going to be done. So the biggest reservoir we're anticipating in Anglia, and two thirds of the supply of that water will actually go to a neighbouring company, uh, Affinity Water, which will also help Thames in terms of some of their challenges and some of the chalk stream challenges to the west of London. So it's a, it's a, it's a very different sort of picture, but actually quite, quite exciting and a good example of actually a radical change to how we used to do it. Brilliant. Thanks, Peter. And I think, you know, something that you were touching upon um, I mean, we talk a lot about some of the chronic stresses that, that we feel, but, you know, there is this increase in extreme events, sort of these acute shocks. And, you know, we can't build ourselves out of some of this stuff. And, you know, I'm curious, and we can maybe touch on that a bit later, how we're going to prepare communities to cope with some of these eventualities, right? And how, you know, what, what's the coping mechanisms that we're going to employ? Um, I'd like to ask Cambria a question, but before that, John, we've got a question for you. Uh, John, you know, you said climate change is a benign term, and so the question was, do we need to change the language to increase urgency, especially public passion for water efficiency? So it's related to, to sort of the drier narrative that, that Peter was talking about. John? Thanks. Yes, indeed. Uh, we're going to talk in a minute about overcoming barriers, and I think that's a really big one, uh, because the main barriers are human nature. So, yes, definitely. Uh, we should be talking about climate heating, uh, about, sorry, we should be talking about global heating rather than global warming. Global warming, people say, oh, that sounds quite nice, it's going to be a bit warmer. No, 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 this is heating. It's overheating. Uh, in climate, well, let's not talk about climate change, let's talk about climate chaos. The, the, of course, the danger of using more evocative, more emotive terms is that 
is that people panic or they think, oh, it's too late, there's nothing we can do to help. I think what we want to convey is we want to convey to people that sense that they wake up at three o'clock in the morning and they suddenly think, oh, we you know this is a really serious problem that's going to affect me, my children and my grandchildren and I will act on it. We don't want to paralyze people, but we want to get it through to people that it really is urgent. So I think absolutely we need to change the language. And those are a couple of examples just for people's consideration. Thanks. Thanks, John. Thanks very much. Kambiri, um, could you talk a little bit again about the Climate Smart Utilities Programme in relation to adaptation um, briefly, because I'm conscious of the time. Sorry, Kambiri. Sure, absolutely. So uh, really quickly, I'll just dive into a few examples. In the Climate Smart Utilities Program, we feature case studies from utilities across the world, right? Uh, one one um, example we had was from Cape Town. So we all are familiar with the situation in Cape Town and the recent day zero, where they really came to a situation where the taps were running dry. So in Cape Town, we had the municipality actually introduce to us what they did to really deal with this with adaptation challenges there. Uh, one of the things they really tackled head on was reducing demand. So in, in Cape Town, rain fed dams are the main source of water supply, and they were able to reduce demand by over 50%, focusing on pressure management, water loss, focusing on clear communication to customers, especially when it came to tariff increases, focusing on uh, managing dam levels and really making sure that the sources uh, for agriculture and domestic usage, this, the users, sorry, making sure that there were a diverse supply of water sources to really tackle these, um, to really meet demand in the right way. So is it necessary to use rain fed dams or could we look at alternative sources where we don't really need to focus on certain water quality minimum requirements? And then we had um, showcased Yarra Valley where they really focus on developing a climate resilient plan. And we've seen this as a common theme in a lot of the utilities that we have in our network, where climate resilient planning and asset management is really um, standing out and really taking front and center. And utilities are trying to access climate financing to really make sure that they have the money that they need when they want to go about asset management. A lot of the infrastructure in all these utilities and in the big cities especially are aging out. And for them to really talk about managing supply and making sure that they're resilient, they need to first work on getting investments to ensure that these assets are secure, that most of the water isn't being lost through leakage, and to make sure that they're getting to the customers in the most rural areas and those who are really left behind. So that's something that we really want to work towards. And we really want to, as Heidi mentioned, we're welcoming solutions from all around the world. We're bringing everyone, inviting everyone to the table. We're working with our specialist groups, experts there, a lot in academia, a lot of consultants to really see that what solutions there are for utilities who are desperate right now. You know, it's not a future problem. They're desperate right now for solutions to make sure that they're very re resilient and to make sure that they can have the resources they need to get ready for that day. Thank you so much, Carla. Brilliant. Thanks very much for that, Cambria. And it sort of nicely sort of leads to the next question that, that I have for, for Desigan. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about progress to, to Road Zero, but Desigan, I wanted to ask you about the role of technology and innovation um, in, in all of this. And, you know, how can we as a sector, we've talked about us being conservative, we're also very slow at taking up new innovation, right? Um, we did some research which should show that it takes around sort of 30 years from when something's sort of published and piloted to when it actually becomes mainstream. I wanted to ask you about how can we do things differently, because the urgency is, is very clear, to accelerate the, the diffusion or uptake of new ideas and solutions. And, and you know, Kambiri mentioned we're, we're doing a lot in IWA, but we still struggle to get that sort of uptake. Yeah, thanks for that, Kala. Uh, and, and, and I will go through this quite quickly. Um, look, the first point I, I want to make is that we have to organize ourselves to be a lot more tolerant around failure. And in fact, we have to organize to shorten that very lengthy process that you described into one that allows more frequent failure, higher levels of learning, moving into demonstrators and pilots very, very quickly. We've got a couple of examples in the, in the South African environment. We're expanding this into the larger African environment and we are seeing dividend for that all of the time. 
But we also have other dimensions of this innovation that we have to explore and embed. And innovation, as it is put as part of one of the pillars now of the global acceleration framework, demands that we have this expanded view. So in the technological frame itself, we go beyond the individual technological developments into more of a nexus approach. And housings like the circular economy and housings like a connection to the other areas of work that are moving rapidly around us, like the 4IR, for example. So Nkambiri's uh, program at the IWA becomes a very, very important part of that. But the banner under which we operate becomes really important. Um, let me come to that shortly. The second part of this is that you've got to have a paradigm of beneficiation. And I talked about this in the context of the sanitation economy. This is available across the value chain of water, wastewater, and sanitation, where you create the opportunity for industrialization. This is what's going to embed and make the system sustainable in the long term. But going a little bit further to the places we don't think about too often when we think about innovation, one is governance innovation. We have to organize for ourselves to have a much more participative approach and give decision makers fewer options to ignore what the science is telling them. I mean, for example, in the city of Cape Town, Cape Town received an advisory on its water vulnerability from the Water Research Commission in 1999. It refused to do anything for six years and plunged right, right into day zero, which was highly avoidable. But there are other governance innovations that need to be explored as well. We then need to organize for a capability building inside the system to empower people to be able to participate much more meaningfully than they currently do. And it's not just about a participative approach, you actually have to have a citizen science approach to, to engage people. And the last part of that innovation array is finance. We've got to get much smarter about the finance mechanisms. We had great sessions on this, as John will recall, in World Water Week, talking quite specifically about climate finance. But this, the, the formulae that are arising in that domain are applicable in many, many other domains. And water is probably a very ideal candidate for some of those new products and blended finance options, et cetera. The last point I want to make is that there has to be a banner that over goes overarchingly over all of this innovation and it has to be the just transition. We have to organize ourselves to move from this low, um, this high carbon economy scenario or this climate heating as John puts it into that low carbon economy, but in a just transition. And there is more than enough evidence that for us is recognized that you can have higher levels of growth, you have higher levels of economic participation, you can have greater empowerment of people, and you absolutely can organize to have for sustainable universal access to water, wastewater treatment, as well as sanitation. Carla, maybe I'll pause there. Thanks very much, Jessica. I mean, it was interesting, some of the points that, that you made. I mean, I was at a, a keynote speech yesterday, I was listening, and, and they were talking about, you know, technology readiness levels, but they were saying that what we failed to, 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 to consider a sort of societal readiness levels, um, organizational readiness levels, and also sort of legal readiness levels. And so they've created these different ladders. And, you know, we fail very often because we think it's all about the technology and not some of these other things. So thanks very much for that. Christine, um, I would like to sort of put it to you. You know, we're hoping to see action by all of the people in this sector and you represent Walk UK. I wanted to ask you what you thought from your experience, what's really important to create the inspiration and the imperative for the action that we so badly need. And, and you have some good examples of what you've seen. Yeah, Carla, that's a, a really good question. We've heard those buzzwords from everyone today, I think, haven't we, around um, collaboration, partnerships, um, sharing. Uh, we're not gonna make progress, anyone working on this alone. And that's why at Water UK in the work we are doing, we're working not, not obviously just with our members, the water companies, but with the supply chain, with policy makers, regulators, and um, <clears throat> environmental groups, and, uh, and with the public as well. An interesting recent example of that, we touched earlier on water efficiency, 
And actually, it was just last year, under the, the new and unexpected pre pressures that COVID created, that we launched the first industry-wide water efficiency campaign, Water's Worth Saving. Of course, um, we all talk about trying to get water consumption down, certainly, certainly in the UK. What we found um, when the pandemic took hold last year, that people were spending more time at home and water consumption was going up. So it was great that uh, everyone came together to work on this new campaign. And myself as someone who actually I have a decade in the energy industry where energy efficiency is, is so well known and understood and widely understood by the public. Um, wouldn't it be fantastic if we can create that same knowledge, understanding and care in the water and in, in the water sector? And I've, it feels like there's been so much work going on. Um, Heidi's company, Peter's company, the companies are doing an awful lot on their own, but collectively coming together in the first uh, national campaign of its kind was a really big step forward. So we're, we're very pleased about that. And, the other thing I thought I would just add talks about collabor collaboration and innovation. And Heidi talked about this new innovation fund in the UK. In fact, we also have the first collective national innovation strategy, which all of our members came together through our sister organization, Aquia, and did a brilliant job and launched this just a year ago, actually, the first sector wide 2050 innovation strategy. Um, and uh, so there are some wonderful examples. Uh, if anyone wants to look at that, it's waterinnovation2050.org.uk. Uh, there's plenty of insight and inspiration to be taken from that. Um, so best practice sharing, um, that's what we're all about. It's been great to hear examples of it today and we expect just to be doing more and more of it uh, as we all you know, progress in addressing this challenge in the years ahead. Uh, back to you, Carla. Thanks very much, Christine. And, and as you say, a lot of the stories we've heard today have been very inspirational. But thanks for that, Christine. I, I, John, I'm going to give you the last word. Um, you know, there are lots of compelling reasons for us to act, but there is a bigger picture here, right? Um, there are many barriers. Um, and so we need somehow to create a conducive, enabling environment to allow us to do the things that we have to do. Um, so I just wanted to, to ask you around, you know, how we, what, what, what sort of things should we be doing to try and overcome some of the multitude of barriers that we face in order for us to do the right thing? Um, over to you, John. Yeah, thanks, Carla. Um, I think this relates directly to a point you mentioned a moment ago about readiness of systems and readiness of people. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that the barriers are mostly to do with human nature, and I really do believe that. Um, I've got six points. Uh, number one is we need to understand that this is political work, this is lobbying work, you know, this is not technical work. Uh, if we only talk to other water professionals, we will not achieve our goal. Uh, number two, uh, we need to grab people's attention with vivid language. And this relates to the question that Karma Loveday asked earlier, and I mentioned briefly, let's use phrases like global heating or climate chaos, whatever. Number three, Let's formulate simple, clear messages that targeted to decision makers. I mean, on the topic we've talked about today, every sewage works a power station. That fits on a T-shirt. Um, number That was number three. Number four um, is involving regulators. We've touched on that a couple of times. And I think this is relevant for the question that Tim Lowe has asked us about uh, barriers to methane use, because a lot of the barriers um, in different countries around the world, the technologies will be different, but a lot of the barriers uh, relating to methane are regulatory barriers. So let's involve the regulators, uh, and they exist in every country in the world. Number five is, is a positive one, which is that because the water services sector is itself working towards net zero, and we've heard fantastic examples of that, uh, from colleagues in this discussion, that gives you extra credibility when you talk to other people because they, when you're challenged, you can demonstrate that you yourselves are putting into practice some of the ideas that you're uh, advocating. Um, and, and sixth, and probably most important is, you know, join with other people, join a movement, and that way we can achieve more altogether. Thanks. 
Thanks very much, John. That was great. Brilliant. Um, we're coming to a close, and I'm conscious of the time, but I just wanted to give, I mean, we had a couple of final questions, and maybe, Peter and Heidi, if you could also talk to the question on, on, on methane or energy production and, and some of the, the limitations to that. We had another question from Roger de Groot about um, data and the lack of data in terms of really trying to understand fairly uh, accurately, if you like, the CO2 emitted per litre of water. Um, so those will be the two final questions that I thought were very short time. So I'll just go around the table and ask people to reflect. We could kick off with you, Heidi. Very short interventions, because about 30 seconds. That, thanks, Carla. Um, I, I, gosh, well, I mean, it's very difficult to sum, sum up in a, in a very short way. I've, I've been inspired today, some great ideas. I've jotted things down. I think if I was to leave any parting uh, message with everybody, it would be around collaboration and innovation. You know, please a big shout out to register for our innovation festival. Um, yes, we've still got some some issues to to work on together. So if there's bright ideas out there, but I'm I'm feeling very inspired and very motivated by by this um, uh, event, by our sector's commitment to 2030. And I like John's point about you know the credibility that we get from you know committing ourselves and having the ideas there um, again but um, feel it coming away from this feeling very confident that we can deliver brilliant thanks Heidi um, Kambiri thank you Carla yes yeah, so I mean today was really good we had a lot of exciting examples uh, we really want to make sure that when people are transitioning to this this net zero space that they aren't actually like uh, causing problems in other parts of the processes, right? So they're really making sure that they're going about this in a smart way, that they're conscious that, okay, the burden is not falling on the consumers in terms of where can you access financing for these, for improving assets, for building more resilient supplies, that they're really finding uh, smart ways to access financing, they're finding smart ways to work, collaborate, with the private sector in, in developing tools and working on free open source programs. So really making sure that by solving one problem, we're not pushing um, the challenges into another issue as well. So that's one thing I'd like to leave with today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kambiri. Jessica. Yes, Carl, two quickies. One, I, I like John's summary, and I want to connect two of his points. Uh, one is about engaging the regulators. But understanding that this inertia of the regulators that really irritates us is in fact a boon because once you get it in there, it's going to be very hard to get it out. And the second thing that I want to connect it to is joining a team. And we have a great example in ISO 3500, which now governs uh, non sewage sanitation, where we couldn't find headway at the national level and 120 or so country teams got together and introduced a global standard that the national regulators could no longer ignore. So tactically, I think we can get really smart. But my final word, Carla, though, is that uh, the race to zero, unfortunately, is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And the place where this marathon is going to be best won is, in fact, the global south. So the invitation is come play with us. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jessica. And Peter, I'm going to give you the final word. Peter. Thanks, Carla. Uh, just linking back to some of the points John made uh, as well. Um, it struck me that the point about regulators, uh, I think I demonstrated in what, what, what I gave as an example around water resources of how you can move. You know, the industry lays out an approach, challenges itself, demonstrates the art of the possible, and actually the regulators came on board with it, seized it, and have actually now enabled us to do some absolutely quite amazing things that 10 years ago you wouldn't have thought were possible so leadership will 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 uh, take lead everybody not just uh, people within companies regulators and governments alike so we should use that uh, and another great example just going to the point you're asking about uh, carbon and, and carbon accounting yeah i mean we haven't got all of the answers yet but um yeah our economic regulator off what has an innovation fund and one of the projects in that innovation fund is called whole life carbon which is kind of looking at the next phase of where we need to go with this stuff where how do you make the trade-offs in your investment decisions on a whole life basis using carbon so get the regulators in the right place demonstrate you know, but show leadership yourself it's amazing how everybody will lean in and and, and go in, in that direction 
And, and the last one I was going to make is both Heidi and I are uh, trustees of WaterAid, actually. So it, it's always useful when we have these sort of engagements to be reminded about the fact that we operate, we're privileged to operate in, in the UK. Um, but we operate in the UK and it's quite different to other parts of the world. And uh, we spend time, don't we, Heidi, uh, around the water aid trustees table thinking about some of the challenges elsewhere in the world and some of the opportunities. So um, that's been very useful for me as well. So thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, I want to thank all the panellists. I think this was a wonderful discussion and um, I'm sure the audience has found it very inspiring because I know I've learned a lot and, and I've really enjoyed listening to all of you. Um, I'd like to now officially close the panel discussions and uh, hand back to, to Kate Lan, who is going to share with us um, some ideas about really how we formally join the Race to Zero um, initiative. Um, so over to you, Kate. Hello again. As I mentioned earlier, we know that many of you will have already made great strides in your sustainability plans. Some of you may have even set net zero targets already or are about to embark on this vital exercise. If that's the case, then we really need to hear from you. We cannot amplify all of the hard work and the efforts that you're taking on these issues unless you join the Race to Zero. Luckily, there is still time to get involved. Please visit www.water.org forward slash race to zero to find out or the many different ways in which you can access the race. As previously stated, COP26 represents the last chance to course correct before humanity faces the worst effects of a changing climate. How lucky are we to be the ones to get to solve this problem? We are under starters orders, however, so it's time to get your running shoes on. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. And I must say a big thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you to Kate. And thanks especially to Carla for expertly chairing such a rich and varied discussion. Thank you, Carla. That was truly excellent. Uh, I think all of us will have learned something um, from that discussion today. Uh, we covered everything. Goodness, green finance, innovation, partnerships, um, natural capital, opportunities for the green economy and much, much more. John's badgers and his grandchildren, much uh, very thought provoking and uh, colorful metaphors to, to keep us all uh, to keep us all engaged. So uh, thank you to the speakers, a huge thanks to the audience uh, and thank you for joining us and thank you for those excellent questions as well, which uh, really helped provoke some excellent discussion. So I just conclude by saying, please, if you want more go to the Water UK website. We have a we have a race to zero section there where you can learn more about how to sign up. We've got a large number of companies signed up already. And we've got also got another of these sessions on Thursday with another uh, stellar array of speakers. So please feel free to go to the website and you'll find out more there. And with that, um, have a great day, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm sure we'll be talking about this for many weeks to come, certainly in the run up to COP26 and well after that. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.